guys are all doing well, staying safe, staying healthy. Uh, sorry about the difficulty I've had so far uploading videos. Uh, I'm sorry if you were delayed a day on my latest lecture and the latest series of videos. You know me, I'm not the best at technology, so I've been trying a few different things with uploading videos. I'll tell you a little bit about what happened. The videos I posted um, was, they were a screen recording of the movie with my commentary over. Well, when I posted them and I tried to post the whole video to YouTube, turns out that you can't do that with copyright. My apologies. So it was delayed and then I just had a difficult time uploading, um, partially because I have relocated for the time being to deep within the mountains. Uh, I have a great view if you guys wanna take a quick look. Yep, that's a nice view there. And this is where I'll be teaching from for a little while. Uh, so now I hope that this system is going to be a little bit better. Instead of watching the movie like I did for the last series of videos, what I would like you guys to start doing, as I mentioned, is I'm going to put more responsibility on you to read through the acts and the scenes for b before each class. What I'm going to do now is take you through a few scenes that I think are super important and I'm just going to really have us focus in on just brief moments in the text. So I am relying on you guys to do most of the work with reading now. You are to, put, to read this essentially on your own. I let you know of a resource, No Fear Shakespeare. It has good translations from, from modern day English. So if you're having trouble with Shakespeare's language, that's a good way of following along. Also, if you just go to Romeo and Juliet, Spark Notes, you can find plot summaries, characters. Um, it's not the best always, but for Shakespeare, it's actually pretty good and can give you a lot of support if you're having trouble understanding just exactly what's going on. That's super important that you do that because what I'm going to do is not just run through the plot with you. I really want to zero in on passages that are very illuminating. And our moments where Shakespeare is really trying to teach us something, as we've talked so much about, this play is not just two young lovers whose families rip them apart. It's so much more, as you know. It's an exploration into human nature and the lack of virtue and how it leads to destruction. And this is these are the things we're investigating. So today, we are going to cover Act 3, Scenes 1 through 4. So if you haven't read through those on your own, or if you haven't at least read the plot summaries of those, go please read those and then come back. Because unless you know what is happening in the play, this is going to be even more confusing for you. So, please take your books out and turn to Act 3, Scene 1. As this opens, we are in the public sphere again, the public square. And of course, the Capulets and the Montagues have been forbade to fight in public under the pain of death. Well, let's just remind ourselves briefly of the action that's happened. Romeo and Juliet have gotten married um, secretly. No one knows except the friar and the nurse. This is causing, this will cause a lot of tension with the families once it comes out. And of course, right now, the tension between the families is that Romeo crashed the Capulet's party and who else but Tybalt uh, is trying to rise up and defend the Capulet's honor and loyalty. So what he is doing now in scene in Act 3 is he's seeking out Romeo to fight him, to challenge him. But he doesn't find Romeo right away. Instead, he finds Mercutio and Benvolio, and the fight ensues. Ultimately, uh, Tybalt kills Mercutio. So let's turn... Act 3, Scene 1, I'd like you guys in the Folgers edition. It's on line 99. What happens is Romeo comes in the middle of the fight and he tries to break up the fight. And as he gets in between Benvolio, I'm sorry, Mercutio and Tybalt, it gives Tybalt the opportunity to thrust his sword under Romeo's arm, thus killing Mercutio. Now that everyone's spread, what we're going to read at line 99 is what Romeo is telling Mercutio at, his, at the moment of Mercutio's death. So these are Mercutio's final words to Romeo. Now just thinking of the character Mercutio, he puns a lot. He's humorous, right? He's sort of the comic relief in this. So what does it mean that 
the person who is supposed to give us comedy is dying. It's making the play turn to a deep tragedy. So, line 99, Mercutio is dying in Romeo's arms, and Romeo says, Courage, man, the hurt cannot be much, Mercutio. No, tis not so deep as a well, nor so wide as a church door, but tis enough to will serve. Mercutio is talking about the stab he received. He's saying, well, it's not as deep as a well or as wide as a church door, but it's enough to kill me. And so now he's about to make a joke. He's about to make a pun. Ask for me tomorrow, and you shall find me a grave man. So this word grave, uh, in one context, it means serious, very solemn. You know, some mostly how I am in class. But also a reference to the grave, the tomb. So that's the pun there. Keep going. I am peppered, I warrant, for this world. Underline here, though, Mercutio's attitude wholly changes. He just goes from punning to saying a plague on both your houses. Zounds, a dog, a rat, a mouse, a cat, to scratch a man to death. A braggart, a rogue, a villain that fights by the book of arithmetic. Talking about how the fight between he and Tybalt was fair, and then Tybalt killed him. And he turns to Romeo and says, Why the devil came you between us? I was hurt under your arm. So a few things Mercutio is saying here that's, that's important. A plague of both your houses. He's cursing both the Capulets and the Montagues. What Romeo, well actually the, the Capulets and Montagues fail to realize is that their actions don't just affect each other, but now their actions are causing the death of other people, namely Mercutio. And so he, Mercutio curses both of the houses of Capulet and Montague, and arguably there is not another humorous line in the play. Mercutio dies, curses them, and the play goes on to nothing but tragedy, and the curse comes true. So, keep going, Mercutio's line, or Romeo's line. I thought all for the best. Help me into some house, Benvolio, or I shall faint. A plague on both your houses. Earlier he said this. This is the third time Mercutio's used this phrase. Plague on both your houses, cursing them. They have made worms meet of me. I have it in soundly too. Oh, your houses. And that is the exit of Mercutio and Benvolio. Now, Romeo is now by himself for this one section. There's these few lines here before Benvolio comes back. But let's listen to what he says. It's a very small soliloquy from Romeo. This gentleman... The prince's near ally, speaking of Mercutio, because remember, Mercutio is a cousin to the prince. My friend hath got this mortal hurt in my behalf, my reputation stained with Tybalt's slander. Tybalt, that an hour hath been my cousin. An hour he's been a cousin, meaning Romeo and Juliet have only been married for about an hour. O oh, sweet Juliet, thy beauty hath made me effeminate, and in my temper softened valor's steel. What is he talking about here? Romeo is talking about how, again, Mercutio died trying to defend Romeo's honor. Why wasn't Romeo there to fight? He wasn't there because he was off with Juliet, getting married, expressing his love. And so Romeo is realizing that in his love for Juliet, he's forgotten the hatred for the Capulets. So now we see Romeo's anger is rising and he thinks that love is making him weak. So he's, he's burning with revenge at this point. So Benvolio enters and says, O oh, Romeo, Romeo, brave Mercutio is dead. That gallant spirit hath aspired the clouds which too untimely here did scorn the earth. Romeo's next line is important. This day's black fate on mo days both do doth depend. This but begins the woe others must end. Romeo is enraged at the death of his friend Mercutio, especially how Mercutio died defending him. And so now he has one goal in mind, to kill Tybalt. This is the woe that others must end. Romeo feels responsible for Mercutio's death. So now he is going to seek out Tybalt and kill him. This is very characteristic of Romeo, is it not? In one sense with Juliet, he's driven by his passion, his lust of beauty, and, that strongly and he strongly pursues Juliet for that. Here, on the other hand, 
He is, again, driven by his passions, but this time passions of hatred and vengeance. And he's going to act impulsively on vengeance, just like he acted impulsively for love. And of course, we know what that means there. So we're going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, we're going to skip the fight scene. Um, and we are going to jump to scene two. Let's just start right away. Um, act three, scene two. So this happens pretty much after Tybalt is slain by Romeo. Romeo finds Tybalt. Romeo kills Tybalt, which is funny because we get the sense through their dialogue that Romeo is not the best fighter. But think of the consequence of this. He's been married to Juliet for a very short time. And all of a sudden, he's killed Juliet's cousin, his own cousin by marriage. This is Romeo not thinking. He doesn't think about the consequence of his actions or the people it's going to impact. Right? And this is also going to cause a lot of tension on Juliet. Her now husband just killed her cousin. Right? There's so much tension about to be, ha be seen here. So we're going to have start with Act 3, Scene 2, Enter Juliet. We're going to start at line 5. Spread thy closed curtain, love performing night, that runaway's eyes may wink. And Romeo leap to these arms untalked of and unseen. Lovers can see to do their amorous rites by their own beauties, or if love be blind, it best agrees with night. Pause here. What's going on with Juliet here? Well, she's in the orchard after she's married. What is she talking about? Spread thy closed curtain, love performing night. She's talking to the day asking it to be night why well this is their wedding night and so juliet is looking forward to consummating the marriage between she and romeo through sexual intercourse and this is what she's anticipating and so she says that she can't wait for night because that's when romeo and she will consummate their marriage together the night though now think back to romeo from when he was lovesick in act one where did we see him? He was under a tree weeping all night long, right? He lived in the night. When the day rose, what did he do? He shunned the light and locked himself in his room and kept himself in darkness, right? And this is sort of symbolizing his dark desires here. Well, now Juliet has been infected with the same kind of lovesickness. Now she's in the day, married, and she anticipates the night darkness so that she can consummate her marriage with Romeo. This, this is the same metaphor, yep, the night is a metaphor here, of this love that shuns the light, shuns the truth, and just lives in its own desires, right? And we see that lovers can see to do their amorous rites, right? Anticipating that physical consummation. Continue on though, we just to this line. By their own beauties, or if love be blind, it best agrees with night. How have we talked about Romeo's view of love, his vision of love? Well, it's blind, right? It doesn't see truth. Well, now Juliet, symbolized by the night, also abandons her idea of love, true love, and blocks out the light just like Romeo did. All right, so let's continue going. About line 10. Come, civil knight, thou sober-suited matron, all in black, and learn me how to lose a winning match, played for a pair of stainless maiden's hoods, hood my unmanned blood, bathing in my cheeks. Okay, this is a very Shakespearean language here. Hood my unmanned blood, bathing in my cheeks. So hood here means to cover or cloak my unmanned blood. Basically, again, she's really... In the same way Romeo pursues her lustfully physically, Juliet is expressing her physical desire to be with Romeo. My unmanned blood, she's saying. So that word unmanned, she's talking about how the blood runs in her cheeks and she's blushing. This is a very uh, sensuous reaction, but unmanned because Romeo is not there. So just like how we have seen Romeo lust over Rosaline and Juliet, now we get Juliet 
expressing the same kind of love which is truly at its basest form driven solely by lust all right let's keep going here there are a few more things i'd like to bring up so continuing on with thy black mantle till strange love grown bold think true love acted simple modesty come night come romeo come thou day and night thou day and night it's the same kind of love block out the daylight block out the truth goodness and come night darkness secret just like how they were married for thou wilt lie upon the wings of night whiter than new snow on a raven's back come gentle night come loving black browed night give me my romeo right this is romeo and juliet just indulging their passions in darkness and in secret. Now, this is one of those times where really this is beautiful poetry that's happening right here. Um, night, night, back, night, die, stars, fine. It doesn't rhyme, but we have the meter here. So it's beautiful poetry that we can get lost in, but really she's expressing her darkest desires. So continuing on. Give me my Romeo, and when he shall die, a little bit of foreshadowing there. Take him and cut him out in little stars, and he will make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with night and pay no worship to the garish sun. Very dark stuff here when you really think about it. She's talking about Romeo's death already. Um, so again, foreshadowing there. But she wants him to be put into the heavens, into the sky, so that the world could worship the beauty of Romeo just like she does, right? We've talked about this image of idolatry, that they worship one another unhealthily. And she wants that unhealthy view of love to be shown through the rest of the world. She wants the whole world to worship Romeo. Keep going, it gets even darker. Oh, I have bought the mansion of a love, but not possessed it. And though I am sold, not yet enjoyed. Here, she's being explicit about her physical desires to be with Romeo. I've bought the mansion of love, meaning I've been, I've, I'm married now, but I have not possessed it. Meaning, I have not consummated my marriage physically. And though I am sold, again, though I am married, I have not enjoyed that marriage. Again, referring specifically to the physical consummation. So, what does this show us about Juliet? One, she doesn't know Romeo just killed Tybalt, and she's looking forward, and just this is a whole soliloquy to express her physical desire for Romeo. So here we see that Juliet's motive for falling in love with Romeo and wanting to be married so quickly truly is driven by her base, lustful passions and desires, just like it is for Romeo. All right, so now... As she anticipates Romeo, the nurse enters in and she's she's so perturbed. She's distressed because she just found out that Romeo has killed Tybalt. And now the nurse tells Juliet that her husband Romeo has killed Tybalt. So, Act 3, Scene 2, please turn to line 75. Line 75. There are two pieces of information the nurse gives. One, the death of Tybalt by Romeo. And two, the consequence of this is that Romeo is not actually going to die. Because that was, remember, that was the consequence. Instead, Romeo will be banished. Now, why does the prince, I forgot to talk about this a minute ago, why does the prince banish Romeo instead of execute him? Well, think of how the fight played out. Tybalt killed Mercutio. Now, Tybalt's a Capulet, and he fought in the public square and killed somebody. So he actually incurred the consequence of death because he broke the law. Well, Romeo, in killing Tybalt, in a sense, dispenses the law. So he, did, he gave Tybalt what Tybalt deserved according to the law. So because of that, that he was acting in vengeance, the prince decides to simply banish Romeo instead of kill Romeo. 
So on 75, this is what the nurse tells Juliet. Now follow along, because I'm just going to read this dialogue straight through, so you need to follow to know when the nurse is speaking and when Juliet is speaking. The nurse begins. Tybalt is gone, and Romeo banish it. Romeo that killed him, he is banished it. Oh God, did Romeo's hand shed Tybalt's blood? It did, it did. Alas, the day, it did. All right, so now here, Juliet just found out the truth that Romeo, in fact, killed, killed Tybalt. Let's look at her initial reaction. O oh, serpent heart hid with a flowering face. Did ever a dragon keep so fair a cave? Beautiful tyrant, fiend, angelical. Dove-feathered raven, wolfish raven, excuse me, wolfish ra ravening lamb. What do you notice about these? Beautiful tyrant, fiend, or enemy, angel. Dove, raven. These are opposites. These are oxymorons, so make sure you add that to your literary terms here. These are oxymorons. What, what is she saying here? Let's just keep reading. Maybe it'll show up. Despised substance of divinest show, just opposite to what thou justly seemst, a damned saint, an honorable villain. She continues with these oxymorons. A damned saint. Well, look at that first line. O serpent heart hid with a flowering face. Her first reaction to Romeo killing Tybalt is shock and anger, right? Like a serpent who betrays. She feels deceived by Romeo, betrayed by Romeo. How is she betrayed and deceived? Hid with a flowering face, right? She sees that she was so captivated by Romeo's beauty, she overlooked the fact that he was a Montague and would kill a Capulet, in fact, and he did. So she feels betrayed by this, right? Oh, damn saint, beautiful tyrant. I was captivated by your beauty and you betrayed me by killing my cousin Re um, essentially revolting against my own family. Keep reading here. O oh, nature, what hadst thou to do in hell when thou didst bower the spirit of a fiend in mortal paradise of such sweet flesh? Was ever book containing such vile matter so fairly bound? O oh, that deceit should dwell in such a gorgeous place? Right. She, Juliet is saying that she can't imagine that somebody so beautiful and fair as Romeo could do such vile actions like killing her cousin. So she's really feeling this tension. Um, and so she's saying that, you know, the truth of who Romeo is, is that he is a Montague and he is in a battle against the Capulets. And that truth of him is hid by the appearance of his beauty with which Juliet has fallen in love with. Again, really showing you that the love Juliet has for Romeo is purely physical and has nothing to do with the actual substance of who Romeo is. So now the nurse responds, there's no trust, no faith, no honesty in men, all perjured, all forsworn, all not, all dissemblers. The nurse is saying, you can't trust men. They're all liars. They only tell us what we want to hear to get what they want. And in this case, it's Romeo's physical desire for Juliet. And where's my man? Give me some aqua vitae. Aqua vitae here is the nurse asking for a drink to calm her down. These griefs, these woes, these sorrows make me old. Shame come to Romeo. So the nurse is explicit saying that shame should come upon Romeo. Compare Juliet's reaction here. She tells the nurse, Blistered be thy tongue for such a wish. He was not born to shame. Upon his brow, shame is a shame to sit. For tis a throne where honor may be crowned. Sole monarch of the universal earth. Oh, what a beast was I to chide at him. All right, so to chide is to shame him, to um, complain about him, right? If you don't turn in your homework or don't take a test, I chide you because you haven't done what you're supposed to. So let's look at this. Juliet just spent a little monologue talking about how she feels deceived and betrayed by Romeo because he, she was captivated by his beauty, but he's really a villain for killing her cousin. And the nurse says, that's right, shame on Romeo. And just like that, Juliet turns and says, blistered be thy tongue for such a wish. How dare you say anything about Romeo? Wait a minute, Juliet, you just said the same thing, but when the nurse says it, all of a sudden you're chiding her for chiding Romeo. 
right? And Juliet says to her, says to the nurse, shall I speak ill of him that is my husband? So what's happening now is we see that Juliet's loyalty has completely shifted. In her love, or rather her lust and desire for Romeo, she has abandoned entirely her loyalty and obligation to her family, the Capulets. And when you read the rest of this, if you go back and look through it, what you see is Juliet doesn't even mourn Tybalt's death. For her, she has a haunting line. Um, and she says that a thousand of Tybalt's death would be better than being separated from Romeo. And now her mind just fixes on the fact that Romeo is banished and they can never be together. They can never consummate their marriage, so it seems. And she is so sorrowful of being separated from Romeo that, again, another haunting line, she says, Tybalt, mother, father, cousin, she would rather her whole family die than Romeo be banished. Right? This is, again, an example of just how far gone that their love is for one another. That it's not healthy because true love, right? a true marriage, makes the families together. And this is why the friar married them so those families could find peace. But instead, What's demanded of Juliet and what she allows herself to do is to reject her family completely and attach herself solely to Romeo. Right? And so now she is just so sorrowful. And she, like I said, she doesn't mourn the loss of Tybalt, but she grieves the fact that her husband Romeo has been banished. So we're going to turn, um, Juliet has a lengthy monologue here. We're going to pick it up at line 121. All right, let's hear Juliet explain more about her feelings of this. Line 121. Like damned guilty deeds to sinners' minds, Tybalt is dead and Romeo banish it. That banish it, that one word banish it, hath slain 10,000 Tybalts. Tybalt's death was woe enough if it had ended there, or if sour woe delights in fellowship, and needly will be ranked with other griefs. Why followed not when she said, Tybalt's dead? Right, so this is where she says, it's bad enough that Tybalt died, but Romeo being banished is far worse. Keep reading. Thy father or thy mother, nay or both, which modern lamentation might have moved, but with a rearward following Tybalt's death, Romeo is banished. To speak that word is father, mother, Tybalt, Romeo, Juliet, all slain, all dead. The fact that Romeo is banished for Juliet is worse than her entire family being killed. That's how obsessive she is with Romeo. Romeo is banished. There is no end, no limit, measure bound in that word's death. No words can that woe sound. Where is my father and mother, nurse? Weeping and wailing over Tybalt's corpse. Will you go to them? I will bring you thither. Wash they his wounds with tears. Mine shall be spent when theirs are dry for Romeo's banishment. Right here, Juliet is saying, let them cry for Tybalt. My tears are for my husband. Take up those cords, poor ropes, you are beguiled. Both you and I, for Romeo, is exiled. He made you for a highway to my bed, but I am made, thy maiden, widowed. Okay, what's happening here? These cords um, that Julia talks about are ropes so Romeo could ascend the balcony and consummate his marriage with his wife, Julia. But now that she's gone, he's banished, Juliet says, well, we don't need those anymore. And listen to what her complaint is. He made you for a highway to my bed. So again, Romeo, the plan to come into Juliet's room and consummate the marriage. But I, a maid, and maid here means virgin, right? Someone who has no, not had sexual intercourse. But I, a maid, a maid, die maiden widow. She's lamenting the fact that that she is going to become a widow, that her husband is going to die, essentially, before she can give herself to her husband. Again, the biggest complaint here, the lamentation, the sorrow, and the grief comes from having never physically given herself to Romeo in their marriage. 
right? So again, really just driving home the fact that this is a love that is purely based on lust. So the last line of this soliloquy, come cords, come nurse, all to my wedding bed, box this line, and death, not Romeo, take my maiden head. Death, take me. She is so sorrowful that Romeo is banished that she now desires death. This is an explicit, uh, an explicit confession of Juliet that she is desiring now to take her own life. So this is really foreshadowing the events that are going to happen in the play. Okay, so now we have Juliet's reaction to all of this. I don't think we need to spend any more time on it. In scene three, we swap to Romeo. Um, and I'll try to post some links of the video from YouTube because they do such a good job of Romeo's reaction here. So the conversation we're gonna pick up with is Friar Lawrence and Romeo, right? Romeo's been banished and he goes to Friar Lawrence to see if anything can be done. So please turn to act three, scene three, we will begin on line 18. <clears throat> So, Act 3, Scene 3, Line 18. We're going to have a very similar reaction in Romeo as we did to Juliet, right? This expressed sorrow that Romeo is banished and he and Juliet cannot be together. This is the worst thing in the world for both of them. <clears throat> so, Line 18. There is no world without Verona walls, but purgatory, torture, hell itself, Hence banished is banished from the world, world, and world exile is death. Then banished is death misturned, calling death banished. Thou cutst my head off with a golden axe, and smilest upon the stroke that murders me. What is he saying? In a similar complaint as Juliet, there is no world without Verona walls. There is no world outside Verona. So just to be clear, by being banished, Romeo can, has to leave Verona and never come back. Well, this is Juliet's home. And since Juliet and Romeo were married in secret, Juliet can't just go off with Romeo. That would, her parents would let her, dis disastrous effects, which we'll talk about. And so he's saying the world is empty outside of Verona because Verona is where Juliet is. And anywhere Juliet is not for Romeo is what he says in the next line purgatory, torture, hell itself. Basically, when we dive deep into this, Romeo has put his entire reality, all the meaning of existence, into Juliet. And to be taken away from her is to essentially, in his mind, is a fate worse than death, a fate worse than going to hell. Look at what that signifies. If he thinks being separated from Juliet is like going to hell, we'll ask ourselves, what is hell? Well, hell is so awful because it is a place without God. So if Romeo is without Juliet and he thinks it's hell, what does that make Juliet? Yet again, he explains that Juliet is the object of his worship. Juliet has become the deity, the God of his life. And to be separated from her is to be in hell. So what does he say? Same thing Juliet says in the lines we just read. Thou cuttest my head off with a golden axe and smilest upon the stroke that murders me. Just like Juliet, Romeo would rather die than live without Juliet. So let's talk briefly about um, this idea of being so sorrowful that they would rather die than be away from each other. Isn't this the definition of a selfish love? If being with somebody is so important that if, if that is impossible, instead of staying alive for the sake of the other, it, you, what you're basically saying, what Romeo and Juliet are saying is, I cannot indulge my desires, therefore I don't want to live anymore. I don't want to suffer anymore. And since this separation is going to cause me pain, I'm going to relieve my pain by taking my own life. 
right? This is how skewed their relationship is. It is not a love that gives themselves to one another wholly and fully, but one that seeks to take the other for the gratification of oneself. In other words, it's a selfish love in which you want the other person just because it satisfies your desires, not gives yourself to another. Right? And this is how deep Shakespeare is getting with these lines. Look at Friar Lawrence, Friar Lawrence's response. Oh, deadly sin, oh, rude unthankfulness, right? The friar's calling Romeo out, saying, what are you talking about? Your life is spared. You should be grateful for this. The fault our law calls death, but the kind prince taking thy part hath rushed aside the law and turned that blackwood death to banishment. This is dear mercy, and thou seest it not, right? The friar is saying, the prince was kind in letting you live, just banishing you instead of killing you. And he calls it mercy. And then he says, you see us not. Let's just look at Romeo's quick response here. Tis torture and not mercy. Heaven is here where Juliet lives. Okay, think about this again. The friar is trying to say that the, that the prince has shown mercy. Well, what is mercy? Mercy is something that God shows man. Right? Man in sin has merited eternal death. But mercy has given man the opportunity to be brought to eternal life. What's the ultimate sin then? Is but to reject God's mercy. And that is the only sin that cannot be forgiven. Well, in a very similar way, what we see is the prince extending mercy to Romeo and Romeo rejecting the prince's mercy. Instead of being thankful for this mercy, he sees it as even more suffering hell because Juliet is heaven. Romeo does not seek salvation from God, but he seeks salvation from Juliet, this idolatrous love. And by rejecting the mercy of the prince, and by making Juliet his idol, he in turn rejects the mercy of God himself. And his love is elevated to this blasphemous idolatry yet again. Right? This is heavy and dark. And he's talking to a priest. So the priest is calling him out on this, saying how this is sinful and all these other things. But we want to dive deeper into this conversation between the friar and Romeo. So what we just saw in these lines is on a spiritual level, Romeo falling into idolatry of Juliet and rejecting mercy, rejecting salvation, rejecting faith. So since faith doesn't work, the friar now tries to appeal to Romeo's intellect, his reason. So turn Act 3, Scene 3, line 55, line 55. Friar Lawrence is going to call Romeo a madman, just like Mercutio called him. Line 55, Friar Lawrence. Thou fond madman, hear me a little speak. Oh, thou wilt speak again of banishment. I'll give thee armor to keep off that word. Adversity's sweet milk, philosophy, to comfort thee, thou art banished. The friar here is going to try to console or comfort Romeo with reason, with truth. Basically trying to under make him understand that banishment is better than death. Romeo's response. Yet banished, hang up philosophy, unless philosophy can make a Juliet. Displant a town, reverse a prince's doom, it helps not. It prevails not, talk no more. What is Romeo's response here? Not only has Romeo rejected faith, but he's also rejected reason itself. He's rejected truth. He won't hear it. He doesn't care about truth. He doesn't care about reality. All he cares about is indulging his desires by being with Juliet. So Friar Lawrence chides him and says, Oh, then I see that madmen have no ears, meaning you're irrational. You're not even listening to me. How should they when that wise men have no eyes? Right? He's being a little snarky to Father Friar Lawrence. Let me dispute with thee of thy estate. Right? Friar Lawrence, trying to explain. And Romeo, underline these lines here. Thou canst not speak of that thou dost not feel. All right. Here's a deep philosophical issue Shakespeare's getting at. Romeo is saying that the friar can't 
speak about anything that Romeo is going through because he's not going through it. Because the friar cannot feel the emotions that Romeo feels. All right, we're going to get to some interesting philosophy here. The highest thing a man, a person, a human being has is his reason. The ability to have rationality and to think. In addition to reason, man also has emotions. And we all know what emotions are. We feel them every day. Oftentimes, our emotions are irrational, right? You feel things and then you act crazily. You do things. And then afterwards you say, you know, I'm sorry I did that. That didn't make any sense. The proper order of a human person, right? The healthy way a person should live is to follow reason above emotion. Romeo flips them. He doesn't think with his mind, he thinks with his passions and desires. And that's what makes him such a toxic person. And so this is where Friar Lawrence, we're gonna leave Friar Lawrence and Romeo. That Romeo's banished and it's hell for him, literally in, a, in his own world, and he won't listen to reason. In act three, the nurse comes to visit as well. And the nurse is basically saying, look, Juliet's upset, Romeo's upset, now we have to formulate a plan for this all to work out. So turn Act 3, Scene 3 still, line 111. Let's see what Romeo says after this. So the nurse says, Juliet's torn up about this. She would rather die than be without Romeo. And so Romeo says... As if that name shot from the deadly level of a gun, right? They just talked about Tybalt. And he says, as if that name shot from the deadly level of a gun did murder her. As that name's Tybalt's cursed hand murdered her kinsman. Oh, tell me, friar, tell me. In what vile part of this anatomy doth my name lodge? He's asking the same question Juliet asked. Romeo says, in what vile part of this anatomy, my body, does my name reside? Tell me that I may sack the hateful mansion. So the mansion here is a metaphor for his body. And he says, where is my name? Montague, Romeo, where is it in my body so I can kill it? And, if, and in, when we watch this, if, you, if we can find videos for it, he would pull out his sword and actually act, almost commit the act of killing himself. He's so desperate and sorrowful now. And the friar and the nurse have to stop him from killing himself. Both Romeo and Juliet are desiring death over banishment here. So we could talk a lot about this, but we gotta get moving. So I would like us to, we're gonna, sorry about that. We're gonna finish out scene three. So act three, scene three, go to line 156. Now the friar and nurse are formulating a plan to help Romeo and Juliet be together. Now, on the one hand, they should just come out and say that Romeo and Juliet are married and see what happens there. Um, the friar knows that his plan to make peace between the families isn't working. And so now he's just trying to figure out a way to save Romeo and Juliet. Um, because they're likely to kill themselves at this point. So on page one, or on line 156, he explains, the, he explains Romeo's plan. <clears throat> he says, first... Get thee to thy love, as was decreed. Ascend her chamber hence and comfort her. So, a few ways to read this. What he's saying is, first off, go to Juliet. You have to leave as soon as possible. Realistically, Romeo and Juliet have one night together as a married couple to consummate their marriage. Now, again, thinking of how young Juliet is, this is bad advice. This is not something that they should be encouraging Romeo and Juliet to do. But this is a very human reaction. These are two young lovers, impure as their love may be, who have just gotten married. And in order for them to complete their marriage sacramentally, they must consummate the marriage. Again, she's 13 years old. And so we shouldn't read this as a beautiful thing, but something that is tragic that two young people this young are falling into such a dark desire. 
And so the friar says, go comfort Juliet, because he's scared of what they might do without each other right now. So it's, again, a very human reaction. Maybe not the right advice, but an understandable uh, piece of advice. So, continue. But look thou, stay not till the watch be set. Because he's basically saying, but don't stay long, because if anyone finds you, then they will kill you. You have to leave as soon as possible. For then thou canst not pass to Mantua. Mantua is another place in Italy. We heard it before, which is why I had you underline it and say foreshadowing there. So, find that line. Um, but the plan is that they are going to send Romeo to Mantua. He's exiled. Where thou shalt live till we can find the time to blaze your ma marriage, reconcile your friends, beg pardon of the prince, and call thee back with twenty hundred thousand times more joy than thou wentst forth in lamentation. So basically, here is the prince's plan. Look, Romeo, you're banished, like it or not, you have to leave or you'll die. So he says, go to Juliet, tell her goodbye, and of course, when they get there, they will consummate their marriage, and leave as soon as you can to Mantua. Stay there. And the friar and the nurse basically make a plan to say, when, when Romeo's banished, we will talk to her parents, Juliet's parents and the families, reveal their marriage, and beg the prince for forgiveness. Basically, let's get Romeo out of here so he doesn't get killed, tell everybody what's happening, and beg for forgiveness. This is a decent plan. A lot of bad decisions led up to this, but now the friar is trying to make things right, and that's what he, he's trying to do. So that's the plan. They tell it to Romeo. Now they have to go tell it to Juliet. But before we get to Juliet, Act 3, Scene 4 throws a wrench in everything. Okay, a little bit of review. Think back to Antigone. Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet is a tragedy. Now, we studied a Greek tragedy, the format of it, with Aristotle, right? And we had, do you guys remember the, the format of a Greek tragedy? Hubris, there's pride. I'm not going to go through all of it. Do you remember the term peripeteia? Peripeteia, what did that mean? Well, peripeteia was a reversal of fortune. Or in other words, in a, Greek, in a tragedy, you have characters who do, do certain actions for an expected outcome. For, an exam, for example, the friar wants to send Romeo to Mantua and then confess everything, beg for mercy, and welcome Romeo home. That's what he expects to do. But Peripatea says that whatever a character means to do, the exact opposite is going to happen. So we need to look for that in Romeo and Juliet. And scene four lets us know how that's going to happen. Scene four, we get Paris once again. Remember, who's Paris? Cousin to the prince. And also, Paris has asked Capulet for permission to marry Juliet. So Paris is coming back to the Capulets to talk about the marriage. Now, t uh, Paris is a very sympathetic guy. And so he basically says, look, with the death of Tybalt, I'm not going to pursue Juliet right now. I will let her mourn. Good. That's the decent reaction to do. Capulet, however, has another move. Turn, Act 3, Scene 4, Line 13. Let's see what Capulet suggests. He says, <clears throat> Sir Paris, I will make a desperate tender of my child's love. I think she will be ruled in all aspects by me. Nay, more, I doubt it not. Wife, you go to here er, ere you go to bed. Acquaint her here of my son Paris's love, and bid her, mark you me, on Wednesday next. What did he just tell Paris? I'll make you a tender or an offer of my child's love. She'll be ruled by me. I'm just going to tell her what to do. What Capulet basically says is, you know what, Paris? I am going to demand, command, that Juliet marry you. Capulet has gone from saying, oh no, Juliet's too young to get married. He moved to saying, well, you know, if you make Juliet fall in love with you and she consents, then you can marry her. And now she, he's saying, you know what? I'm going to arrange the marriage. 
and she will obey me no matter what. This is no wonder. Well, let's one more detail. And bid her mark you me on Wednesday next. But soft, what day is this? Paris, Monday, my lord. Monday, well, Wednesday is too soon. A Thursday, let it be. Thursday, tell her she shall be married to this noble earl. If you thought Romeo and Juliet rushed into things, we can understand them because she's 13, they're kids, they're excited, driven by their passions, and of course they make bad decisions. Can't imagine that you, as teenagers in high school, know anyone that's rushed into a bad decision because of passion. But this is supposed to be a nobleman, a man, and what does he say to Paris? I'm going to command Juliet marry you on Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then he says, Oh, you know what? Wednesday's too soon. Better move it to Thursday. Not only is he he's he forcing Julia into this marriage with Paris, who is presumably older than even Romeo, but it's three days from now. Three days Juliet is going to be married. Again, if we think Romeo and Juliet rushed into things, no wonder they did. Their parents have taught them nothing else. In other words, Romeo and Juliet learn their impulsive actions, where they act without thinking, from their parents. Now, while Romeo and Juliet are fully to blame for their actions, we can understand how their lives and their thoughts were formed by somebody like Capulet, who rushes into a marriage for, her da for his own daughter. Right? So, th there's a lot of irony going on here. The biggest one is this, that Capulet is now going to prepare Juliet for a wedding to be married. The irony is that she's already married. So this, of course, is an example of dramatic irony. Capulet doesn't know his daughter's married, but we as the audience do. So how is this related to the Peripatea, the reversal of fortune? Well, Friar Lawrence's plan is to send Romeo off to Mantua and then resolve the issue and then bring Romeo back. But if Juliet is supposed to be married to Paris in just a few days, that's not enough time to explain things, ask for forgiveness, or anything like that. So there are things happening that make their situation so much more complicated. And Act 3, we're going to get, the rest of Act 3, we're going to get a lot more information on exactly how that's going to play out. So that'll conclude our discussion of Act 3, Scenes 1 through 4. For now, for homework, I would like you guys to read the rest of Act 3, so that would be Act 3, Scene 5, as well as Act 4, Scenes 1 through 4. So again, for next class, please on your own independently read Act 3, Scene 5 through Act 4, Scene 4. Again, use Spark Notes if you need to, use Romeo and Juliet, No Fear Shakespeare, and please continue answering your reading comprehension questions and filling in the literary terms chart. That's gonna help you for what we're going to do at the end of Romeo and Juliet. Um, just on one last note, I wanna thank you guys for your patience as I figure out this online distance learning platform. Obviously, you can see I'm being a little more casual about this in the turbulent times we're going through, but it is so important that you don't blow this off. Uh, it's so important that you really do understand what's going on in this play, even more than what I'm explaining to you. I want you guys to learn to be able to read and understand this yourself, especially with resources out there to help you understand. Um, I know for a, a little while, for the rest of this, it's going to be rather difficult uh, as far as grades go, because <clears throat> you don't... I'm not, I'm not uh, assigning you things to turn in. Instead, I am going to expect that you turn in both the reading questions and your literary terms chart at the end of the unit. So that's going to be a huge grade. It's basically going to be the same amount of homework assignments you would have for an entire unit, all at the end of, the, of Romeo and Juliet. So really, don't waste time and put it off to the last minute. Ask students from last semester. That didn't work out so well for them. Um, but with that, please keep diligent on this, and if you have any questions about anything, please email me directly. Um, if you respond on Google Classroom, 
I might not see it because it goes to my spam. Also, let's make sure whatever we do post are helpful comments to both myself and the class. Um, with that, one last announcement is if you would like the opportunity for poetry test corrections, please email me directly. We're going to have to figure out a way for me to get the test to you so you can make those corrections. But other than that, I hope you guys are doing all right. And again, please contact me with any questions, and I hope to see you guys soon. All right. Happy reading.